Dale, did you get that link then? Yes, yes, thank okay. you. Okay, perfect. Yep, already set them all. Very good. I'll give it about 30 more seconds and we will get started. Um, Adam, one question for you, as far as if there are questions that we don't get to at the end, um, is there, what's the best way to get those questions to you? Do you want me to give out your email address or do you want them to come to me and I can forward them to you? It's, I, I've got my email and contact info at the end of the presentation. Uh, I'm fine with, I'm fine with folks reaching out to me, however, or we can, you can keep a list of them and I'll, I'll get some answers and you can flood out to folks just one way or another, don't, don't let anything go unanswered. Perfect. Yep. That sounds good. Well, uh, we got 531 here, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, as always, we are uh, really excited to have you guys. Uh, this is week five, I believe, or maybe even six on season two of our webinar series. And really excited about our guest from Tennessee. And uh, I don't really want to spoil the intro or anything, but we're, we've got a treat for you. Um, Basically what we've got is you guys are all muted right now. Uh, we're not gonna be able to see you, but if you do have questions during this presentation, you can go ahead and type those out either in the chat bar or in the Q and A portion. And we'll start here. Adam has a presentation. He's gonna go for about 40, 45 minutes. And he mentioned earlier that he really uh, thrives on Q and A. So if you guys have any questions that you have for Adam, you can type those out and we'll get to those right around about 6.15 and wrap up sometime around 6.30. So with that, um, Keith, do you wanna talk a little bit about why Adam is on here this evening and yeah. why we're so excited? Thanks, Noah. We're, we're really excited to have Adam on. Uh, Adam is one of my favorite guys to listen to. And I was thinking about this earlier today and, and uh, I was telling Adam too that, you know, we, we had a whole list of potential speakers and then we kind of voted on it internally as a sales team. And we told him that he won, he won the popular vote to, to, to get invited to be on. But I think well, the reason that myself and so many other people like listening to Adam, three reasons. Number one, he's got a tremendous passion for soil health and for the resource. And you'll be able to hear that and see that. And, and I think even through Zoom, you'll be able to feel that. Uh, that passion just comes through really loud and clear. Uh, number two, he is not speaking from a theoretical standpoint, he's speaking from practical experience because uh, it truly could be said he is from the government, but he is here to help you. And he is not just advising his farmers in his county from the desk. He's out in the field with them. He's adjusting equipment. Uh, he's right out there with them in the dirt and he's got his boots dirty. And I really appreciate that with about him. And then the third thing is he's just funny. <laughs> He's just a hoot to listen to, and, and maybe it's just because we don't we don't hear that southern drawl up here so much, or some of the little sayings that he'll have. But uh, it's I, I listen to his talks with a smile and a chuckle all the time, and I think you will too. So I, I appreciate that with, about him as well. I always learn something, and I always have a few laughs. So great combination to have. So Adam, we look forward to hearing your talk and uh, interacting with you in the Q and A session at the end here. So appreciate you joining us tonight. Well, thank you all for having me. First off, it's an honor, honor to even be asked, and uh, it sounds like y'all built it up pretty good. We'll, we'll see how it goes from here. I'm gonna go ahead, know if it's all right. I'm gonna try to share a screen here and see how this works out. Okay. All right, Dale. I can still see you. If you can see a PowerPoint that come up, can you give me a nod? Okay. Looks good on our end, yep. All right, sounds good. Uh, well, folks, uh, appreciate everybody having me here. And he, like he said, I, I'm pretty passionate about what I do. And they asked me to do, do a little talk here tonight. So what I'm gonna call this is transitioning from something into a higher functioning agroecological system. And the reason why I use that word something is because I don't even know who I was on here, or what stage you're in, but we're all starting from something, whether it be a full tillage scenario into, you know, we've been no-tilling for a long time, or maybe we're done doing a lot of uh, regenerative ag, but I mean, we're all transitioning for something and we're gonna continue 
and transition no matter what what we do. So that's kind of just a little bit of reason why I titled this the way I did because there's sometimes there's something in the title. Uh, hold on just a second. I ain't got the slideshow ain't working. That figures. Okay, well, maybe I'll run it this way. Okay, well, hey, just sorry about the technical difficulties, but just a little bit where I where I chase this passion and where it comes from. And in the yellow circle right there, that's Coffee County, Tennessee, located in southern middle Tennessee. And uh, inherently, uh, it's just a special place. And, you know, and I'm just going to come straight out and, and be honest We we're pretty spoiled right here uh, where we live and where we farm at, what we're trying to do. We, we don't battle latitude. We don't battle precipitation. We don't, I mean, it's just a good place for stuff to grow. Uh, we got good inherent soils right there within that little yellow uh, polygon. We kind of call this area Little Iowa. Uh, you go around us in any counties, you don't see the big row crop, the big production agriculture. It's just a special little heart here in the valley, it's got good inherent soils. We average somewhere in a neighborhood of 58, 62 inches of rain a year. So we get plenty of moisture and it pretty much, we've got a long growing season. Now, right now tonight, we're supposed to get down to about 18 degrees here. So everybody's panicked and there's no bread, no milk or anything in the stores. We had about a half inch of snow today. So this, this county here is turned upside down. Uh, but there's about 53,000 acres of reported cropland here in the county that I work for, for NRCS. And I've been back here working in the field since uh, 2013. And uh, out of those 53,000 acres, I must say somewhere over, over 52,000 of them are annually. It's, this is no-till country. Uh, folks were no-till in here from the inception in the early 70s, and they've stuck with the no-till. And the reason why is just, because of our climate, uh, we, we get enough growing degrees that we get enough winter weeds that we, we leak, leak enough carbon in the system that no, standalone no-till was pretty good to us. And uh, when I came back to the county, uh, no-till is what I knew and I thought things were right from that. But then I got introduced to soil health and got to thinking that there might be a little bit more. And since we started here in 2013, out of those 53, thousand acres we're averaging a little better than 30,000 of them are are in cover systems primarily corn soybeans with diverse cover crops growing in the winter and out of that about 20 to 25,000 acres of what we've got in cover so we actually manage the biomass and manage it to a point where we got crimpable biomass going into corn and soybeans uh, starting out started with a few farmers and now pretty much if, if you've not tried cover crops or soil health uh, in Coffee County, you just pretty much ran from me. Uh, we've, we've highly incentivized this program uh, over the years. We're up to where we've spent, we've invested about $10 million of financial assistance through into soil health through EQIP, CSP, state cost share, uh, we really don't discriminate where the dead presidents come from. It all spends just about the same. Uh, bought roller crimpers for farmers to use, uh, seeding implements. So we've tried, tried to make it as, as easy a transition financially and as we could. But one thing I realized once I got back to the county is I kind of had to look a little bit about where I'd been, where I was now, and where I thought we could go, comparing that to our farm systems. And, you know, I think just probably if you're listening to this webinar, we've all started over here on the left in some type of tillage system with that old Bel Air. And folks, that's just, I can't put it in planer, that's just soil degradation. All right, and then we moved into no-till. And I work for the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Uh, I think this agency does a good job and it's got a good meaning. But now me personally, I, I, there's nothing wrong with conservation, okay? Conservation's fine, but when we think about conservation, what we're thinking about 
is we're just conserving something at the state it's in. It's not going to get any worse. It's not going to get much better. And for me, professionally and and personally as a producer, I have a problem conserving something that I know is in a degraded state that's not functioning at the ability that it can. But the beauty, no matter if you're sitting here in Tennessee or you're, it don't matter where you're at, as long as the sun's shining, that field, your farm, your, your operation has the ability to be rejuvenated. And when I'm talking about rejuvenation, I'm talking about taking a resource, the soil, and getting it functioning as designed. It was designed to function a, a certain way. It may not be the way that we think we want to make it function, but it is designed to naturally function the same way. Now, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that every field we've got in the county is at a full state of rejuvenation. It's not, but we moved past no-till and we're going to the next step. And the way we've done that has came along that, that we real quickly realized, and I think this holds true for anywhere, that the rejuvenation of our soil, it does not start with the implementation of principles, okay? With planting cover crops or buying no-till equipment. That's not where it starts. It starts with we, in our mind, have got to start understanding ecolo ecological functions, okay? Because then if we start understanding how things are designed to work, then we can make the decisions on what we want to do. And it's real simple. Uh, some of you at the uh, no-till on the plains, I gave a whole talk on knowing your why before your how. And I think it's real important that we have to know why we're doing something before we ever think about how, how we're going to do it. And, and there's a reason why it's kind of hard for us to know what, you know, what does our soul need to function? Heck, I mean, you can type it into Google and Google, Google can't even tell you the answer. It, ain't, it don't tell you what the soil needs to function. These are the actual, what pops up when you type this into Google, it just tells you what the functions of the soil are supposed to be. And I think a lot of our mind, that's the way we work. We just expect our soil to be able to do something because we don't have no understanding of what it really needs to function. And the main missing link in that is we don't view our soil, we've not been trained to view our soil as the living ecosystem it is. I wasn't trained that way, wasn't brought up that way, didn't, didn't manage the soil professionally for a long time because I did not focus on the understanding of it's, how, it's a living ecosystem. And it's so simple for us to look at any other living critters. We can look at humans, cows, sasqu even a Sasquatch, and we can easily mentally picture what does that living critter need to be able to function properly. And we have an understanding that if it doesn't have what it needs, it's not gonna function properly. You know, and if you're wondering what that second picture is, you all may not never seen that, but that's actually the state bird of Alabama. And we can even look at that critter and understand what it needs to function. But if I just simply show you a picture of the soil, man, it, it, it's, it's a mindset change. that We've got to start thinking about what does this living ecosystem need to function? And it's real simple. You know, well, there's a lot of, a lot of talk and a lot of things, and there's a lot of things that we can do to enhance the function of this ecosystem, but you can boil it down to just three things that it has to have to function. It's got to be fed, it's got to be watered, and it's got to have a static address. And the key to this is it's got to have this every day, not just during the growing season. Now, this is going to go on during the cash crop season a lot, right? Probably going to be a lack of diversity but it's going to be fed. It's going to have a chance to be watered and it ain't going nowhere as bad, right? But we got to start concentrating on doing that every day. So, you know, we've been no-tilling up here in Coffee County since Moby Dick was a sardine. And, you know, we thought we had this thing licked. No-till had been good to us. But as I started looking at these fields, it was quick to determine that these fields were not functioning as they were designed. And see, I've been a professional symptom ad addresser. That, that's what I was trained to do is address symptoms instead of fixing problems. 
and that, and that gets us into a false security. Because if I look at these long-term no-till fields, been in no-till 25, 30, 40 years, all right, they're starved. Well, that's not a problem. That's a symptom. The problem is, see, as the sun shines every day, but we ain't got nothing out there growing to absorb it. All right, we've got erosion. That's, that's a symptom. The problem is, is our surface. We've got a naked surface. The same thing for vertical erosion. I don't care if your field has no slope, it's perfectly flat. If it ain't covered, it's eroding. All that what poor space it may have, when that rainfall falls on it, breaks apart those microscopic soil particles where there's no aggregate stability, and it starts infiltrating down vertically, what poor space you've got sealed off. So every field's erodible. There's no such thing in my mind as non-highly erodible versus highly erodible fields. That's a false security. We had low, <coughs> low infiltration. And folks, these have been no-till for 30 years and still look at the problems we have. Compaction is not a problem. Compact, or it's a symptom. The problem is we don't have any aggregate stability. And then we didn't have any biological diversity. We grew five things for 50 years, corn, soybeans, and then we grew hen bit, chig, wheat, and buttercup. Luckily, we had enough, it was warm enough and have enough moisture that we could grow that in the winter. So don't start addressing symptoms on your problem, go, or on your farm, go ahead and let's think about what's the problem and let's fix it. The symptoms take care of their cell. Now, one thing that helped me do this is, and y'all, as you hear me talk, you'll, you'll see I kind of get off the wall on some of my thought process sometimes, but I don't like to think in cycles no more. And the main reason is cycles are meant to be broken. And, and, if, and if we think in cycles, we are automatically setting ourselves up to have broken pieces on our farm. But if we start thinking about flows, all right, flows of carbon, flows of nutrients, flows of moisture. See, the river, it may be at a high flow sometime and it may be at a low flow, but there's usually going to be a little bit of flow going on. And we, and we never know how much it's going to be, but we're always going to be able to flow something. And I think if we'll start thinking about flows on our farm, flows of life, flows of nutrients, flows of energy, I think it'll help us understand our whys better. I know, you know, the main goal in this is when we get our soils functioning, we get results, okay? And I've got all these goods listed. Good moisture, good temperature, good carbon flow, good, 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 good. We just stack these goods. Folks, sometimes they're going to be great. Sometimes they're going to be lesser, but when our soil is functioning as designed, it's going to be as good as it can be at that climatic condition. Whether we're in higher rainfall, higher temperature, low rainfall, low temperature, wherever we're at at this point in time, it's going to be functioning as good as it can be. And what this, the end result of this is we get resilience. You know, we'll have droughts, we'll have cold spells, but if I, but how many natural ecosystems next to the fields you all have farmed have failed during these times? Now they may have not produced as many acorns or many hickory nuts, or they may have not new tree grows or whatever, but did the whole system collapse like it did in our field. And that's what we want to get away from. We want to fill the bins in good years, bad years, and in between years. We want to always try to be able to fill the bins. Now, soil health, you know, it, it's been a buzzword and it's an important word, but I, I try to keep it real simple. And I tell you how simple it is, which Brady Darty, he's my oldest son, but when he was nine years old, I asked him what soil health was and he explained it and drew this out to me. Now, don't get me wrong, he's probably a little bit more brainwashed than most nine-year-olds are at, on soil health and virginity bag, but he drew this up and I think this, I use this in about every presentation I give. It's a real simple system that's designed that we're put here to, to manage properly. The sun shines, the plant absorbs that, it gives off some oxygen, it leaks some sugar in the ground, the bugs want that sugar, they eat it and the plant and they exchange nutrients or whatever the plant may need. That's how the system's designed to work. And the problem we have is I asked Brady, I said, Brady, 
what happens if we don't have a plant growing? He said, well, dad, it won't work. And for, you know, I'm not saying that we have to accept it or we have to agree with it. But if I think, if, but if a nine-year-old can understand it, I think we can too. Folks, no matter where we're sitting at tonight, listen to this, we all have these commonalities, okay? I'm in corn and bean country and cover crop no-till country. And we are all farming fields that have some level of degradation. Some are worse than others. But the thing about it is, is they all share this potential, okay? But where the potential gets killed is we can't progress positively if we're in denial of these whys. We, we can't be in denial that our field's not covered, that our field doesn't have any diversity. We cannot be in denial of this, okay? It's a hard pill to swallow, but it's the truth. And I think a lot of it, you know, a lot of these campaigns have come out, you know, the shovel is the most important thing you can have, you know, and, and I like it, it's cool. But the most really important tool that we can have for soil, for our farm, our community, the region, the whole worldwide, it's not a shovel. We can dig all the holes we want, but we got to look in the mirror. What are we going to learn? What are we going to do about what we learn? See, the whole responsibility in this lies with us, voluntarily with us. You know, and I don't want to see us where we get where it gets more regulated than what it may already be. But if we can't take our responsibility and do the right thing. And, and here's the beauty about it is doing the right thing, it would be a hard pill to swallow if it meant that we couldn't be productive, that we that our livelihoods were going to go down. But when we build a resilient resource, is it not it's not only better for our operation, but it's better for everybody. So, you know, it's got it's got a place. And that's a lot about on the whys, you know, why I saw this in Coffee County, why our fields wasn't working. And it all came from education. You know, it all got built from education. I'm not somebody, I'm not going to tell nobody what to do. I want to send out my education, share education with them, and let us understand our whys, because the how is the easy part. How to do this when you really are committed to understanding and want, and want to make things function properly, the how is real easy. Now, it's going to be different from a lot of us. But it's simply by just understanding how this resource is designed to function, okay? And we implement the management which promotes these functions and we dispose or wean off the ones that degrade, okay? I'm not one of these cold turkey folks, all right? I, li I like to start weaning off some of this stuff because we've got to do this while maintaining or increasing our bottom line, okay? Our billfolds are at the forefront of importance on this whole journey. Now, if it was just about soil health, I'd go here in Coffee County, I'd go plant a winter cover crop, let it reach its state, crimp it right down, plant a summer crop, and I'd keep cranking that and put a few cattle on it. And my soil health would go out the roof, but my billfold would be flat. So the way I really worked with a lot of producers, with this and you know we've all got our opinions but i think this is kind of pretty proven here in coffee county is we focused i didn't go to folks start and preaching reduction 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 okay let's start maximizing this stuff that you all are putting out there anyways all right if we can build the biology if we can build the herd if we can keep moisture if we can keep aggregation if we can keep that soil cool you all can still be putting on some of your stuff. Let's capitalize on it. Let's let's start let's start filling the bins big time. Okay, so that's kind of my deal. Is I like to looking on the maximizing the formulations. You know, we've moved away from the dry fertilizer and all this stuff, and now we're real concentrated on infertile fertility, uh, chelated nitrogen, sugars. You know, looking at stuff that's easier for the biology to be able to synthesize, to put into a fruit that turns into money in our billfold, as opposed to some of the other formulations. And it's my primarily a focus on reduction of salts. That's primarily what I'm talking about there. You know, I take a little grief from this, but 
you know, saying this, but I'm not found a way to starve a profit out of a gar hole by just reducing inputs. Okay. I, I mean, you take something degraded, then cut out the crack that it's used to. Yeah, I mean, it's not going to produce results. So it is a process. I've been involved in it for seven years now, and we're just now in some fields really making the turn where we can start even thinking about significant reduction. Early on in this journey, uh, something I realized here in our high yielding corn, and well for us it's high yielding. When I'm when I'm talking corn, you know, the guys that are doing a top notch job of this, you know, we're we're in excess of 200 bushel corn here in Tennessee, and you know. 70, 80 beans, 70, 80 bushel soybeans are, are you know, co common common talk around, around the coffee shop. But nitrogen's the last for us to go on our corn crop. That's that's where we, we still get a big return on investment out of that. But folks, the MP and K, that, that is not the only inputs that we have. You know, and what we realize first off is our most profitable when we're talking reductions, they're gonna come out of the tips of these sprayers because we're here in Palmer pigweed country our no-till beans were averaging four to five trips across those in some cases to control Palmer soybean or corn was seeing you know two to three sprayings a year depending on the situation but when you can go in and start crimping biomass and grow corn and the next time you know the only time that sprayer sees the fields in a burn down and then you can come back with one post on soybeans you know, that's starting to redu reduce, you know, those are inputs as well. You know, and everybody in Coffee County, they'll they'll take one trip a year, they'll go down, find the closest sand they come to, and then all the SUVs will have a salt light sticker on their on the back of their SUVs. And, you know, it's getting to a point in no-till that I, I was gonna go ahead and retire from NRCS and build sprayer life stickers for everybody to put on their vehicle. Cause that's all we done was ride sprayers around. So, but we got out of that, so I had to keep working because I didn't hit the market on getting the sprayer life stickers for everybody to put on their car. So, everybody's kind of seen these uh, principles, and these are kind of mine and my layman terms of, of how I like to approach when I'm working with producers and stuff or explaining transitioning from no till or tillage into these systems. And we've got to keep the soil covered. Okay, first and foremost, if we're not taking the energy out of the raindrop, destruction's happening, okay? Living plants, you know, just like my son said, if we ain't got something there absorbing the energy, this ain't gonna work. It drives everything. It feeds the house. I am a big believer in diversity. I do not understand all of these synergistic deals. I probably never will, but I do not defy nature. Nature, I, does not, I do not think lies to us. So I pump as much diversity as we can. Like I said, we're spoiled here. We can grow just about anything, all right? So, I mean, I can, you know, every year we're putting warm seasons in with our cool season mixes, you know, so we, we, we have the opportunity because of our latitude and growing climate that we, diversity is something that's real easy for us. And then, you know, you've probably seen the, uh, the principle of eliminate or reduce disturbance, tillage, however it's worded. I like to look at it from a different standpoint. I want somebody to understand what tillage does. And even more so than that, I want you to understand what it takes to restore those detrimental effects that that tillage event had. And if you and then if you get to where you understand that, then I think the tillage problem will take care of itself. Now, one thing that that does, you know, it's just hard for me to swallow, especially in our rotations and where I farm and across the biggest part of where the biggest part of our cropland is, is quit trying to justify this tillage. Lord, I have heard of all the reasons and all the things, but I'm gonna tell you the only function it ever has or it ever will, and I wish I could change it, okay? I, I wish every once in a while we could just go out and have a little recreational tillage to blow some steam off It'd be good for us. But the only thing it does is release carbon from our soils. It will make a field smoother every once in a while, but that, guys, that's all it does. It is going to release carbon, you know, and we're looking, you know, some of y'all may be up from the corn belt. You know, if it worked 
And if it had a positive effect, those native eight, seven, eight percent organic matter soils, they wouldn't be at three and four now. So it does not do anything to promote any function of the soil. Okay. And then I really like when we can integrate livestock. Okay. That's just that soil health graduate level. But man, our fields have really shown the fields that we've integrated livestock on, they whoop everybody else's tails. You know, it's just magic the way nature was designed to work. They're, you just cannot replace a room in it. Okay, so take you down real quick, just a little bit about where did we start at? Okay, here we were coming out of long-term no-till. We moved into low biomass covers, came out there and smoked it and burned it down before it, it scared us any. So that's where we started at. And then here we are in first year doing some of that. You know, there we got a new roller crimper this producer did and we just had to use it. There is absolutely no reason not getting a bit of benefit out of rolling that cover right there. Might get lucky and kill a southern prairie bowl or get unlucky and run over a skunk. But you know, I just leave that slide in there to show that, that you know it's not really doing anything. Don't have any problems planting any the only problems you're gonna have no matter where, if, if you're planting into something like that, as long as, as, long as the tractor starts, you're, you're going to be fine, okay? No problem with that. So that was good, kind of like what we saw. But look at our resource right there. Remember when I got back to talking about the problems? Not the symptoms, but the problems. I'm still naked, right? Look at those algal blooms right there where I'm wasting nitrogen, okay? So I still got problems right there. Is it better than standalone no-till? Yeah, you bet you it is but we can still do more, right? Still got more potential. Learn real quick, it's hard to rejuvenate the resource when you're planting by the calendar. And, and trust me, there is real peer pressure in farming, okay? But it's but the calendar should not, should quit dictating when you plant. You should plant when, if you're serious about this, when the conditions are right. Because why are we, why are we doing this? So we can manage and be resilient when the weather's not the way we want it in a perfect condition. So year two, you know, the way human nature is, if a little bit's good, then a little bit more is better. So we got started planting, green planting corn and soybeans and everything that looked like this, just leaving it standing, running through there, still had no problem. The vetch and stuff, it hadn't got big enough where it's wrapping around or anything like that. So we moved into that. Grounds covered a little bit more. That's better than what it was the year before, but still look at that carbon I got standing up. You go look at nature, that's really not the way nature's carbon layer is designed to feed the soil, is it? You know, most of those high, car high carbon nitrogen ratio residues you're seeing right there, they're, you know, they're, it takes fungal component in the, in the microbial community to really synthesize and break that down and get that stirring. So I don't have the fungus up there floating around in the air. So go right on down the road the same year, cover crops at the exact same state, but just a little bit of change in management makes all the difference in the world. And this has just been a journey of the aha moments for me in real life. You know, I'd seen it on YouTube and heard about folks doing it, but it's different when you're doing it on your own and doing it where it hadn't been done before. But that plant's great. That hybrid comes up, equals sunlight. Uh, now look at the way our soil is covered. We've got the roof on the house. We're taking the energy out of the raindrop. We have the ability to keep it cool. When the rains come, we have the ability to let them infiltrate in the ground. Move right on in along year three. Just, you know, if a little bit's good, a little more's better. So, a lot more ought to be a lot better, right? So we started moving into this. And now this is pretty much typically what you see in our county on, on about 20, 25,000 acres a year. Uh, this is how we're planting corn and beans. We're not planting April 1st no more. But you know, when you get to talking about cover crops and all that business, you know, you can you can sit there on that green cover seed calculator and come up with a perfect mix, get that thing planted early, uh, design the perfect mix, but then go out there and lose all potential in the way you manage it. 
Here in my neck of the woods, we can put on more biomass between March 15th and April 15th than we can between September 1st and March 15th. So I, you know, the key is, is we've got to let this stuff grow enough that we're able to give our field the potential to be able to function as it's designed through the cash crop season. And when you get into stuff like this, you got to be careful because by the time we got done right here, we'd ran six Sasquatches out of that field right there. That's where the Squatch Nation happened at in that field. But you know, you look at that, and man, that looks pretty intimidating because if we took that 3,600 Kenzie into that field right there without getting it on the ground, we would have went about 50 foot. And for the next three hours, all I'd be doing is getting cussed while I'm trying to get everything untangled so we could run 50 more feet. But see, you get that on the ground and it, and it really changes our perspective of how we see it, the manageability of it. But folks, being successful in planting is not going through a field and not tangling up the planter, getting stuff wrapped around. We actually, you know, my folks were not going to settle for, yeah, Darty, all this soil health and bugs and stuff you're talking about, that's pretty cool. But, you know, we still, we still got to grow a cop. So they wasn't going to sacrifice stand. You know, if they wanted, they're shooting for 32, 34,000 plants on their corn. By golly, that's what they wanted. So we had to make sure that we precision planted this and got this the right way. But you take something that's very intimidated, that's got, you know, you barely can walk through it, turn it into this, and then you come back there and now you got the start on 80 bushel beans that didn't see nothing except for a combine. When we start doing that, we can start making some money, okay? Then we got into some of this rank stuff on corn. Now you look at that and that looks like that's quite a bit of biomass and it's, it's really not that much biomass, it's just tall. But, you know, folks, I do not want my corn crop starting out in something like that. You know, it, you know, we're just at, you know, there's no way that we're not going to take a yield hit when we got spindly corn trying to come up through that and start setting ears and stuff. So we got to roll in a bunch after we planted. All right. And, you know, I've seen no negative results on us rolling, crimping after we planted, uh, long, long as we don't get going on the same road. So just in general, we'll usually go in there after we plant and we'll, we'll take off on about a 10 to 15 degree angle, different what we planted, just make sure we ain't putting something right down the road right there. But, you know, this is just common, what we moved into and, uh, and how we manage. And we might get in some questions a little bit later on on nutrient management. That's a whole two hour talk on that. But if y'all got any questions on that, I'll maybe cover a little bit of that later on. <coughs> so we started out doing this for about four years solid. All I've done is live in the fields, doing a lot of analytical testing, physical testing, trying to find the answers. And everybody likes a good graph. So, you know, I graph the study right there. Everybody likes to take pictures out of your phone. So if you want to know everything goes on in soil health, there's your good graph and you can just figure it out. But what I'm trying to get out of it, guys, it's complicated. It's very dynamic. It ain't never the same. It, it's, di it's different on Monday evening than it was on Monday morning. And, uh, you know, and that's, you know, I just kind of put that in there to be a, be a joke. But, but within that, our producers here, they, they've gained a lot of wisdom and they, they've learned how dynamic this system is. And it's mainly because they understand what the functions are that they're trying to promote. Uh, just to give you a little example of, you know, where do we start at? One thing I think that we have done right is we started diverse from the beginning. Uh, diversity didn't really scare us. And we started out with some cereals and some legumes and uh, some brassicas in the mix. That's kind of our standalone. And now it's just pretty common that every field will have an eight to 12 way mix. Uh, we have moved away from her, uh, from cereal rye here in our neck of the woods. It, cereal rye can just get so big and so lignified and the carbon nitrogen ratio on it re really gets high where, you know, I thought that I was probably tying up a little bit uh, nutrient flow by, by managing some of this mature cereal rye, especially in corn. And it, it got to be a problem with us on trying to get some of our fertility down and some of that business. And we're lucky enough here at our latitude that we don't have to rely on cereal rye, okay? So, you know, the uh, barley has basically been our replacement for the cereal rye here in this area. We 
we played a lot of different stuff, try to get diverse and uh, and really, you know, instead of concentrate, really just trying to concentrate on managing that carbon nitrogen ratio. And, you know, ideally, as soon as it gets to a crimpable state, that's the ideal time for us to be planting our corn. And, you know, like I said, took a lot of analytical data. Uh, it, it showed a lot what we were expecting. But I think a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, this is actually one of my fields that had been no-tilled forever, corn, soybeans. And then that same same block of dirt two years after. And I really didn't care what the analytics said. I'm glad that they showed what we wanted to, but but that's, you know, we're going from dirt to chocolate cake. And uh, it's just a tremendous difference what, what just a little bit of time can make. Uh, Analytically, kind of what we saw going on, I've done a three-year study across 58 fields, had about 2,200 acres in this study that was sponsored by Tennessee Department of Agriculture. And where we started out after, you know, 30 years of no-till, basically, uh, you know, soil health calculation of 12, that doubled over the three-year period, just on average. Our PLFAs started at about 2,500. Uh, they doubled, tripled. Uh, over a three year period. The reason why I've got the distinction between the 4,500 and the 6,500 on PLFAs, it was a clear outlier everywhere we integrated livestock, averaged about 2,000 nanograms per gram higher than where we did not integrate livestock. Uh, one day CO2 burst on Haney's test, you, you know, just went from 50 to 350. Uh, now it's not uncommon, uh, you know, we're getting one day CO2 burst in the six, seven hundreds on these fields. It's remained in this stuff for se seven, eight years now. Water extractable carbon, this right here really bothered me at first before I understood what was going on. Basically, we were increasing the biology so quick that we couldn't keep up. We couldn't, we couldn't put, pump enough sugar to it. Uh, now that started uh, getting a lot more linear and following the CO2 burst, but we we pretty much shocked the system. We put so much biology in it in our in our climatic conditions that we were we were eating the soil. We were eating up all the food. There was no leftovers. One of the important things that really helps us here, uh, we usually get some rain, but we're always two weeks away from a drought in our neck of the woods. Soil temperature, uh, especially these hybrids we grow, they have the ability to yield high as long as we can keep the soil cool. As long as that hybrid can cool off at night, we can, you know, we'll, we don't have any pollination issues. And I mean, we may not be setting any yield records, but we're still gonna have a good yield. And everybody always says, well, keep the soil <coughs> cooler. And I always say, well, compared to what, how hot was it outside and all that business. So we collected a little bit of data there and just look, look at the forest. That's a template. That's what we hadn't messed with. And then look at our, no-till systems compared to our conventional till systems on temperature and then look at the more we start managing mimicking nature and managing our cover and getting the biomass down look how we start mimicking nature and look at our soil temperatures so when it's 92 degrees outside 95 degrees outside and we're keeping the soil temperatures in the 80s we can still conserve moisture we can still grow a crop Infiltration, I think, is one of the key indicators that you'll see. You know, luckily, one of the main things our system's lacking is moisture. Well, one of the best thing, one of the first things that comes back into the system's aggregation, we're able to start getting some water in the ground. And our conventional till fields around this area, they're, they're, they always stink. They're, they're less than one inch per hour. Long-term no-till, going from one inch per hour into 30 years of no-till, gained us one to two inches per hour on, on infiltration. We doubled that in one year of cover crops. As after year three, when we increased the biomass, we had fields that were averaging in the 20 inch per hour. So going from two to 20 in a three year period, that's pretty significant for me. Here in our no-till country, our, some of our rolling land, you know, we always got these little washes in the, in the valleys and stuff. And it, just somewhere magically around at between what year one and two, when we started getting in that four inch per hour, all these washes stopped. Uh, one thing about infiltration rates, folks, they're, they're very dynamic. You know, when, when we're saturated, they're gonna be lower, when we're dry, we're gonna be able to really get some water in the ground, but, but these trends are static, okay? I've seen this over and over, that, that conventional is always gonna be bad, long and no-till, 
feel a little bit better and our cover fields are always going to be better during any condition. This one was something that we didn't think about much and I don't think folks really think about it until they really get in the system. Now keep in mind I'm talking about green planted covers, not after you burnt covers down because once the cover has been terminated, then you're just dealing with climatic condition and sunshine on, on, on controlling moisture from that point on. But when we're dealing with green covers here in our neck of the woods, when the no-till and the conventional ground's too heavy to plant, we're planting. When everything's prime and everybody's happy, of course, we're planting. And then these moisture robbing cover crops that we think about, when the no-till and the conventional ground's too dry, guess what we're doing? We're still planting. Is that ground dry? Yeah, it's ground dry, but it's also very aggregated and very receptive to these no-till planters. We can still plant in it. Not only does this give us a lot, a bigger logistic window, but the conditions, no matter where we're at, they're more optimal. Now, I'm not saying when we're, when we're mudding in corn in these cover crops, it's not heavy and we're not mudding in a little bit of corn, but it's a lot better than if we was mudding in corn in conventional or no-till. The same thing when we're planting in dry conditions. I'm not saying that our cover fields are just perfect. No, but we can get a planter in the ground on them. Not only are these times good, better for planting, but then let's shift forward into the growing season. No matter what times we're in, wet times, good times, dry times, my resource is still going to be as productive as it can at that time as compared to our other systems. And the wet, good, and the dry, I mean, that's about all the times we can think about. That covers about all of them. Well, close up here, because I'm going to assume that we've got some folks that uh, are not in as a 60-inch uh, rainfall environment like we are. But no matter what, it, uh, it takes moisture to grow these covers. I'm, I'm not going to dispute that point. But we cannot conserve or regulate moisture without covers. The only other way we can do it is go out there and maybe blow and mulch our fields. So, you know, it costs about $800 an acre to put a quarter inch of mulch on, on a field. So that's going to get pretty, it's going to be hard for us to make that pencil out. So it's a lot cheaper for us to grow the covers. The field has got to be covered to have any ability to regulate or manage moisture. And then let's think about it from this standpoint. In a non-irrigated environment, everything I do is dry land, but I don't have any ability to manage when it rains. But I do have the ability to manage the vapo, evapotranspiration. Even in an irrigated environment, I have the ability to manage both. And that's the best of both worlds right there. But we'll run, we'll run this irrigation just to watch it go up in the air. So we, we got, I want, to, what I want you to think about is we got a lot more days with potential to lose moisture than we ever do to gain any moisture. That's where we can come in with having our heads, the, you know, the silver bullet right there is our ability to think to where we can regulate that. You know, and let me just ask, you know, we, we don't do anything fallow around here. So, you know, as I started traveling the country, I never really understood fire, fallow or the principles behind it. But where does that mimic any natural principle? Where in the world does fallow mimic any natural principle? Because every one of those fallow fields that we think that we can manage better nature design, think about what they were before we decided we could manage them better, okay? Now I'm gonna end with this right here because this might bring up some questions. And this is from my neck of the woods, but I think it's also a mind shift change that we all need to think about. And I could care less about organic matter as a metric of success, okay? I would rather us concentrate on the flow of energy in the system, all right? These fields, these high producing fields that I'm talking about, in my neck of the woods, we're at 1.8 to 2.2% organic matter, all right? I've not seen any big strides in increases in organic matter over a seven year period. Now, where we've integrated livestock, I've seen some fields that's had some small ticks in it. So if the metric of measuring using organic matter 
is the a big metric of success. My advice to you is, is if your biology does not go, does not hibernate, if you don't get cold enough where it freezes out, where my biology, it never hibernates, I've got to feed it all the time. So I don't look at organic matter as a metric of my success. All that means to me is if I can make big gains in organic matter, then that means my biology is hibernating and not eating up the energy in the system. Now, don't get me wrong. I want to have high organic matter, but it's gonna, it's gonna come with some equilibrium that we've not reached. So I'm more concerned about making sure that I've got granny sitting there cooking three, four squares a day, that, that no matter what, everything I'm needing is provided for instead of worrying about my pantry down here in Tennessee. Because even our analytical data showed that we, we can pump so much biology that it's hard for us to even provide enough sugar to keep everything going with the biological populations that we carry over from our growing season and cover crop season where we're really growing in, into those times when we're not pumping as much sugar into the ground during, during when we, we're not actively growing. Luckily for us, it's not much. It changed some years we have hard winter, some years we don't have much of a winter at all. But I've really started looking at the flow of energy because that's that's kind of what needs to happen in the system. So with that, folks, I'm uh, humbly thank you for your time. Uh, this is, I wish all of you the best in this. It's gonna be a journey for all of you. It's, it's not gonna be the same. Uh, in any of you, there's my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me at any time. I, I eat, sleep, and breathe this stuff and always join, enjoy talking to folks about it. One, one short sword's always sharpening the other. But with that, Mr. Noah, I'm going to turn it back over to you and try to minimize this thing where I can see the, see the screen, okay? Absolutely. Adam, thank you so much. A um, lot of comments on the, the graph. Um, that was pretty funny. I, I should have had my audio on for half of that because I was laughing through most of it. So I, I appreciate that. Um, we do have a couple of questions here. So guys, like I said, if you have questions, um, we do have a little bit of time here at the end if you want to ask those. The first question is the planting green in general, do you use row cleaners or a wavy coulter or any uh, type in front of the opening blade? Uh, done a little, done a little bit of all of it. In general, the common planter here will be that we'll have a 13 wave, 13 wave coulter on the front or a bubble coulter. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of spring load or spring down pressure, move it into more hydraulic down pressure. Uh, row cleaners, not not so much. Most most of our biomass is getting big enough that that we cannot run the row cleaners unless we crimp ahead of the planter. Okay, uh, so we started out with the row cleaners when we were doing basically what I call enhanced no-till, planting in the low biomass stuff. But once we started getting into the bigger stuff, uh, the row cleaners kind of went away, and now we've actually moved into no coulters on the planter. We're finding under some planting conditions that just a straight double disc opener on our green and blue planters is working fine and even better than a coulter on some of the other systems, which of course now on the red planters running the offset uh, opening disc, you know, it's it has no issues. Okay, this is from uh, Jimmy Emmons. Adam, what do you attribute your success to? We see pockets across the country like Coffee County, but how do we mimic what you're doing to narrow the space in between those pockets? He also had so proud of you and your success with the producers there. Well, thanks, Jimmy. Uh, I guess just knowing people like Jimmy Emmons helps being able to pick his brain. But to answer the question more seriously, uh, I think it's all based off education, okay? I, I really think... I, I don't think that there is a producer across this nation that does not want to do, be more productive, do the right things, and invest in invest in their land. However, I think there's a disconnect still yet on how, and that's why I tried to emphasize on this, on how the resource is designed to function. And I think once once we as humans have an understanding of how the resource is designed to function, 
then all the hows come into play. Uh, I, I think that partnerships and pro professionals such as NRCS, Ag Extension, I think we have a real responsibility and a role to work with producers on this. Uh, I, think, I think we have a real responsibility to be aggressive in seeking financial assistance. It was a no brainer in Coffee County, Tennessee. Uh, it's easy here. I'm just gonna be honest. It is easy to do what we're doing as compared to other geographic regions. And I, and I think that's where investment from the community and ag industries and stuff like that really need to work with producers. But to answer the question, it goes, it goes back into a lot of education. And, uh, and then you got to have producers who are willing, willing to listen, maybe willing to make some changes. Uh, God bless me in a special place. I mean, uh, producers here in Coffee County, you know, they've been pretty innovative as far as no-till long before we ever introduced the concepts of soil health. So, you know, a lot of that has a lot to do with it, but I, I still think there's a wholesomeness in the soil, in the, in our souls that we want to do the right thing. And, and a lot of times it's just being exposed to a way that is not only better for our livelihood, but it's better, better for the whole, for everybody in general. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. Um, Fred asks, what is a typical rotation of cash crops and covers in your area? Okay. Typical, uh, we're in a corn soybean rotation, some wheat, uh, but corn, we're, we're geared up trying to, trying to get on some of our upper ground that's Mid-April is when we try to shoot for. Uh, hopefully what we're looking at is, you know, ideally April 15th, if we got soil temperature 58, 62 degrees, we're probably gonna be hitting the ground running. Uh, we'll be looking at growing 108 to 113 day corn that usually, you know, 1st of September, we're, we're getting the combines fired up. Uh, that'll be followed by Typically chasing the combine, sowing covers. We started out as all drill. Now we look at a lot of other things where we're running, broadcasting the seed, running some crumbler baskets. Uh, we'll run roller crimpers, just something to get the stalks down, maybe fluff the residue a little bit, uh, doing some of that. The, these cover crop blends will have eight, 12 things in them pretty much typically now. And then we'll come back in and be looking at Late April, May, first of May-ish, being getting started on our full season beans. Uh, we will go down as, as low as a 2.8 uh, on some beans, um, but we, you know, our full seasons are running a 2.8 to a mid four. Uh, where we got wheat in the rotation, uh, chasing, those, chasing those with wheat beans. And then we, we, stay, we stay warm enough usually that our, our wheat bean, double crop beans will come off late October, 1st of November, and those those covers there, if we've not airplaned them on before, we can get those drilled in and, and still get a pretty good stand as long as we let that biomass grow long enough for the next year's corn. Uh, cotton, uh, we'll, we'll mix in cotton in the rotation. I don't have a whole lot of cotton. The county south of me has got a the county south of me's got quite a bit of cotton and the guys that are doing going down there, you know, we're looking at running the same deal. Uh back to row cleaners. Uh most of most of the folks I'm dealing with that that's that's running cotton, uh, we are using row cleaners on those. Uh hoping to start looking in on on cotton, looking at reversing hood sprayers and going in mid March and stuff when that bio, when that cover crop six. 12 inches tall in some places and burning down strips on 30 inch strips about six inches wide to get away from the row cleaners and to be able to come in and no-till the cotton. It's it's a little bit more finicky. It ain't as it ain't as vigorous as our corn and soybean coming up, getting started on this. But it can be done. Okay. Um, we'll probably have time here for one more question. You guys, uh, I think Greg asked if you could go back to that last slide. I'm not sure if that's for the, the contact information, but it, um, we probably won't have time to get to all these. So if you do have questions, uh, Adam did say that you can send him an email. So I'll let him, he can put that up here. And while you do that, uh, a question from Jillian says, do you ever do a SAP analysis to see if there are any mineral constraints uh, that might enable you to get higher levels of photosynthesis? 
That's, we pulled, we have started, had a few producers that have sent in some sap analysis. We've done tissue analysis for a while. Uh, sap analysis, that's something new enough to us. I, I just I just basically understand the processes of sap analysis and I don't have enough personal experience with it other than just regurgitating some of the others I've heard what they talk about it. So I, I like I like the sap analysis ideal. I, I think it's I think it can be very beneficial for us. Uh, you know, one thing that that I have noticed over our fields, and I, I attribute a lot of this to the diversity that we're planting, because we'll take analytical soil test and uh, pre-planting there, you know, two or three weeks prior to planting when this cover is really starting to grow. And, and man, we're deficient. I mean, we are deficient in, in, in our traditional analytic test, but then somehow or another, our crops don't show any of these deficiencies. And once we start getting in this year five, six, seven, that, and we start getting some fungal component back in this soil, well, you know, this is the stuff that the smart people know, but I don't, I don't understand all the processes, but I know we are starting to be able to tap into this organic pool because if not we from traditional thinking we would have to be showing deficiencies in in these cash crops we're growing so you know our climate is allowing us and by managing these carbon nitrogen ratios on these covers i don't know if it happens five days later i don't know if it happens 20 days later but somehow another nature's working with this and, and we're not seeing the deficiencies that we would see in a standalone no-till or conventional that had the same analytics pulled on it. And then we send off these cover crop samples and it's it's pretty obvious where it is. It's all in the biomass, but it's pretty amazing how quick that, how quick nature's taking back over and the interactions are happening where we're not seeing these deficiencies. Uh, you know, one of, one of the things that we have seen, and this kind of gets into the SAP analysis a little bit, it would kind of, the SAP analysis will be predicting what we're seeing later on but some of these fields that we really got cranking, uh, you know, on, on these corn hybrids, we'll be cutting corn at 18, 16, 18%. And this corn looks like silage, the stalks, the plant health on it, you know? So I, you know, to me, that's just a, I'm kind of a simple man. And, you know, when I'm, when it's taking me a lot of horsepower to get through 18% corn, cause the stalk looks like it needs to be cut for silage that's letting me know that something's going real well in that fourth quarter and that, that plant, all it wants to do is keep living. Hmm. Well, um, with that, we'll probably wrap up. Adam, thank you so much for your time here this evening. Um, I learned a lot. I hope everyone else did as well. This is recorded. And so we will have this link available sometime later this week. If you wanna share this with people that uh, you think would find the information valuable. Um, as well as all the rest of our webinars. Those are on our website and on our YouTube page uh, as well. Next week, um, I believe we have Christine Jones on, so we're excited for that talk as well. And that'll be at 5.30 Central Time, same time as this week. So thank you again, Adam, for your time. Do you have any closing thoughts for us? Uh, no, I just appreciate y'all having me. Uh, sorry, I, I planned on not going so long-winded, but you know how it is. I, everybody says I talk slow anyways but that's, that's a geographical phenomenon, so I can't <laughs> help it. But, uh, but no, folks, I, I'm open. Uh, you know, Dale knows me, Noah, Keith, all of them, Jimmy Emmons. Good to hear from him. Uh, reach out to me. I, you know, I may not get right back with you, but I, I'll try not to let anything, no answers get, or questions get passed by me. I'm always open to try to help. That's all, all we're trying to do. We're all in this together. And, uh, uh and I'm just, admirable of everybody that's tuned in that that no matter where you're at in this journey uh from the bottom of my heart i, I appreciate your interest in it and and i wish you all sincerely wish you all the best so thank y'all well it's, it's just like he said uh obviously adam is somebody that is is in it to help you guys out so for those questions that i did not get answered his email okay. address is right there if you guys want to send those to him Adam, thanks again. Um, Dale and Keith, thanks for hopping on. We'll see you guys all next week for Dr. Christine Jones. No, have a good one.